Hello and welcome to AgriTalk. My name is Susan Mwangi and today we are hosting Dr. Henry Maduma who is a veterinary surgeon and a specialist in pub public health. Dr. Henry, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Karibu, do you understand Swahili? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get to know who Henry is. <laughs> so, um, like you've heard, I'm Henry Kamagi. Uh, I'm a veterinarian. I'm based in the U.S. Um, I've, I've been in practice for the last 16, 17 years. Uh, right now, I'm deep in public health research. And um, uh, in, uh, I've done quite a lot of work in the dairy industry. So I'm very, very passionate about um, uh, dairy, the dairy industry in general. And that's what my work as a veterinarian has um, uh, centered on for the better part of my profession in 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we're talking about dairy production and dairy systems. What is the first thing that should ring in our mind when we hear that word? Now, when we talk about the dairy industry, the first thing that comes into my mind is the value to the farmer. Now, um, I'm fortunate to come from a country that values the dairy industry in general. Uh, we see a lot of farmers investing a, um, a lot of money in purchasing dairy cows. And the whole idea is to improve on milk production and to improve income at the end of the day. It's about financial bottom lines. So when we talk about the dairy industry, the first thing in my mind is how is the dairy industry going to profit the farmer? And in a larger scale, how is that going to profit the country in general. And I believe there are a lot of potentials in that regard. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if somebody is thinking about dairy farming, what is this first thing they need to put in uh, perspective? Is it about the breed? Is it about the housing? What is the first thing? And how long should somebody be thinking about this before the initial establishment of the farm? Now, it is more of a holistic approach. Um, uh, you can't just focus on the breed alone. You can't just focus on the genetics alone. You can't just focus on the environment. It is a holistic approach. You're going to look at the housing. You're going to look at the dairy breed. You're going to look at the financing bit of it. You're going to look at the most important part of it being the veterinary part of it. How is the farmer going to benefit from the veterinary aspect of the dairy industry? And we have so many um, registered veterinarians that are um, specialized in the dairy industry. And um, my opinion is I don't really believe the farmers make good use of this resource at their disposal. So it is more of a holistic approach in that regard. Yes. And I loved what you mentioned that, I, I don't know if it's our culture, but many people are not really open to training because even many times when we have such programs, you will see a very, very small turnout from what you would expect. It. So, and I feel like maybe that is where we are losing out on. But again, like focusing on Kenya, I can say that dairy industry is one of the rapidly growing industry in Kenya. Why do you think this is so? Most of that has to do with the way the, um, the dairy industry was packaged traditionally. Uh, most of the people associated the dairy industry with subsistence um, uh, farming, where people will keep cattle just for subsistence purposes. Uh, what will benefit you for food on a day-to-day -day basis at the level of the family? But with the growth in the dairy industry right now, dairy production has been commercialized and now production is at uh, commercial levels very very high intensity high output levels and i think that is the disconnect that uh, exists there are people who are living in the current times but still with the mentality of the subsistence level of dairy farming but we've already shifted the focus to the commercialization of that industry as it is right now. It is that bridge that we need to uh, find a way of, uh, 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 of, it's that gap that we need to find a way of, of, of bridging. Yes. And what do you think can be used to fill that gap? Because again, I'm also looking at our, our dairy farmers being the small scale farmer who's just learned on how to integrate the cropping and the dairy farming. They're still trying to balance and seeing which is which, or maybe just for the sake of complementing the, the farm and the manure from the animals. So how, how do we hit the... Now, now in, in, in my opinion, I think, first and foremost, we have to focus more on the knowledge utilization and how to disseminate that knowledge. Most people, um, uh, and I'll, I'll, for them that are Bible-believing, they talk of, my people are suffering because of ignorance. So um, the first step towards 
trying to improve this is making sure that we disseminate that information to the lowest person down on the ground. And that's going to be the farmer because that's where the rubber meets the tarmac. That's where it all happens. Are they really aware? Do they have the knowledge of the kind of breed um, uh, improvement programs that could be there? Are they really aware about the veterinary programs that are at their disposal? Are they aware of the credit facilities that they can access in order to improve their bottom lines? These are some of the things that they can uh, benefit from right away. But most importantly, I think the dairy industry has to shift from paying the farmer for the volume of milk. Because for the longest time, when I grew up, we knew of KCC, where farmers who just put milk in cans, the cans will be taken into lorries and taken to cooperatives. Now, the dairy industry as it is right now all over the world has shifted from paying the farmer for the volume of milk, but now they're paying the farmer for the quality of milk as well. That bit of information is still missing. That yes, you can produce a lot of milk, but can you produce it in a way that meets quality standards that are championed all over the world? And we need to disseminate that information all the way, trickle it down mm -hmm. to the farm. Okay. Yes. I know we may not have the whole day to actually just do an assessment of this, the, the steps that a farmer need to take to achieve the quality of milk that the cooperatives will be expecting. Right. But from you've done a lot of field surveys and all that. What are the best breeds? Maybe we can start with the breeds as you take uh, us through just the, also the veterinary uh, management services that farmers should be looking out for. Now, every breed is peculiar in its own uh, qualities. Uh, I'll talk of uh, the Holstein Frisian, commonly known as the black and white cow that you see around, known for the high production of milk. But then um, the fat production of that particular breed is not at that high level. You find that the Jersey breed, if you are focusing or targeting uh, fat production, fat, butter fat, then you'll go for the Jersey. Now, if you want a middle ground between those, then you perhaps might want to go for a crossbreed of the two. So um, that's a very, very sensitive question to, to answer in the sense that not one particular breed is a one size fit all kind of breed. Uh, you'll find one that is good in, 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 in its resistance to, say, particular conditions. They can survive better in adverse conditions. You'll find other breeds that do not as much uh, in those conditions. So it is a more of a little bit of here and here, take and leave, but you have to mix them together to come up with the product that you want. So I can't really say in particular this particular breed will meet the demand of the time, but it just depends on what exactly are you focusing on. Are you focusing on high yields in milk? Are you focusing on butter fat? Are you focusing on protein? Then you can breed and focus on those particular traits. And that, that's, that's the way I think it should be approached when you are looking at breeds. So no size fits all uh, approach works. Yeah. What you're saying is that the most important thing is for a farmer, first of all, to ev just uh, find out what their production goal is and then also go for knowledge and research to know the perfect breed for that. Exactly. And then now we have the right breed. Right. We have decided this is, I, I want a lot of milk. I want to be uh, a higher milk producer. Right. So what is the next thing that I should look into? Now, if you decide that you want to be a high milk producer, then the first thing that comes into your mind is, do I want to make money out of it. And if you ask most pa farmers uh, at the level of the dairy, their main interest is actually to make money. So then, the marketing beat comes in. How am I going to market this milk? One. But what are the attributes that whatever marketing facility are looking for? And how can I meet those demands? In other words, if they're looking for high quality milk, then how can I tailor my production system to meet those standards. Now, and I think in my earlier uh, statement, I did say that we need to shift more from the volume of milk. The world has already moved on from, from, from volume. We are now focusing more on quality. So the areas of the people who are buying milk, for example, in Kenya, we are talking of Brookside. They have particular things that they are focusing on when they want to buy milk from a farmer. They can say, we want milk that is low in bacteria. They might say, we want milk that is low in somatic cell count, or we want milk that is high in butterfat and protein. 
the responsibility of the farmer, therefore, at that point, is to find a way of meeting those particular demands. And that's where the knowledge bit comes in. You have to go in, you cannot do it with quacks. You have to go into a professional, be it a veterinarian, be it an animal production specialist, be it an animal health assistant that has full knowledge about what your production system is all about and what you are targeting. Then they will advise you accordingly and you will tailor your production accordingly as well. Yes. Awesome. So you've worked here before also, before you relocated? Yes, I practiced so here. I'm still, I'm still a registered veterinarian in Kenya. I'm, st I'm also a, re a registered veterinarian in the United States. Okay. Yes. So I want you to give us a, a, a scenario of some of the things you've seen in Kenya or maybe what some of the things that we can adopt that are happening in the USA that we are lacking here and that can help us even become such a powerful industry in the dairy sector. Now, the dairy sector, um, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't want to use the word um, uh, challenge, I want to use the word opportunity. The dairy sector in Kenya has a lot of opportunities and I will share some of the things that I've seen out in the States that I think can easily work in our environment. One, the monopoly of the dairy market. Right now, uh, uh, in Kenya today, the biggest marketer of the dairy liquid milk, so to call it, is, say, Brookside. Now, can you imagine a situation where we had several Brookside-like uh, organizations? Then that introduces a very critical component of competition. When there is healthy competition in the market industry, then the farmer and the production prices are manageable to the farmer. Now, I think that is what is missing in our, in our system. Now, is it a bad thing to have? No, but that is an opportunity. The other thing that I think uh, works well out in the West, not just in the US, is a lot of emphasis on uh, um, getting professional help. The veterinary industry, I have a feeling the veterinary industry in Kenya is not as appreciated as it is in the West. Now, um, uh, this I can tell you from experience. When you introduce yourself as a veterinarian, as a veterinary doctor in the United States, the level of respect is kind of different. But how do we look at the veterinarian in Kenya today? Now, Dr. Wamnyam, out there. Uh, you know, uh, if your cow has a problem, and we eat a flan flan, out the village doctor. Now, we have to focus more on giving a lot more respect to the veterinary industry. And I think that is an aspect that is missing. People think that the veterinary doctor's work is just to help in bathing cows around. But the, that, it is a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. And you come out and find a different level of appreciation out there that you don't find here. And we need to focus more on giving much more attention on the respect we give to the professionals, especially the veterinarians that are practicing and able to help the farmers. Now, how are we going to do that? You cannot do it by going to the cheapest person in the market because cheap comes with a cost as well. People go for cheapness, but sometimes they lose out on the quality that they get out of those services. And we lack out on that. You can't blame them because sometimes you just want to, aff it's a, a function of affordability. Maybe they can only afford somebody who is cheap. But what I'm trying to say today to the nation is, cheap is not always cheap at the long run. Veterinarians are not that expensive, but we are not that cheap anywhere as well. So I think there has to be that strike of a balance and it is possible to be done, mm -hmm. yes. Do you think that the Dr. Wakijiji, you know that village doctor who's been there, worked all years round, and there is no way you will convince these villagers now that you, your knowledge is really not relevant. Do you think there is a way we can combine the expertise of an, our educated vet uh, profession and uh, this uh, Dr. Wakijiji such that they are able now to even advance their knowledge and give better services? Because they don't be, sometimes, some of them are still thinking in a very conventional way, you know, the doctor that comes with a white kabuti, and then there is the other one who will come with their conscience and they know, you know, they've done it for years. Yeah. Now, all registered veterinarians or animal health practitioners are supposed to be registered uh, with the Kenya Veterinary Board. Now, Dr. Wakijiji, is he a registered animal health practitioner, number, five, number one? Uh, Dr. Wakijiji, is he an animal health assistant, or is he just 
daktari wa kijiji out of the fact that he is experienced watu wamemwona kama anatibu wanyama and therefore ye ni daktari and it works many times like i said earlier on there is value in getting professional service there is a lot of value in professional service and i'll give you a good example look at it this way if you were sick today and you were told that so and so who has grown up in your village uh, is going to give you the help many times that comes with a cost as well. It could be the cost of care, it could be the level of care, it could be the quality of care. Extrapolate that in the uh, uh, veterinary industry. Same scenario. So, am I totally against Dr. Kijiji? No, I know sometimes it works. But then, we need to emphasize the work of getting professional service. We really need to emphasize that. Uh, we need to get service from people who are trained, who understand we are living in the times of antimicrobial resistance and this is a big thing in the world today not just in kenya and how part of the reason why we are ending up in situations of resistance even in the human health industry is because of careless prescription of antibiotics and how does it start when you give people who are not trained in handling handling drugs to handle drugs but then why would you go to that person when there is somebody that has taken time and studied these drugs and he understands them? He knows the interaction. He knows everything about these drugs. So, again, I'm championing the use of professionals uh, for services, especially for veterinary services. That is what is ailing us today. And I totally concur with that because we've seen livestock die in the hands of the traditional doctors. We've seen even human beings die in the hands of this herbalist, you know, right. and, and that kind of a thing. So let's talk about feeding. And, you know, uh, I think in the dairy sector, that's where we get to hear it, cows do not know whether they're in the hands of a rich man or a, or a poor man. Right. The, the moment you buy one, you realize it's not going to eat from a plate. It feeds in volumes. Right. So how do we manage that? Um, now... What happens is the biggest, the biggest part of, of, of making sure that animal, our animals um, actually survive best is, like I mentioned, try to focus more on, on, on the professional service. Focus more on the professional service. I, I can't overemphasize that. Now, cows do not choose um, uh, what plate they're going to eat from uh, or what pasture they're going to eat from. But you know one thing that I believe a cow will appreciate? If they were treated by somebody who knows what they're talking about. I, I'm not a cow, but I believe I'm talking for so many cows out there. Uh, that they will appreciate uh, uh, being attended to by, by professionals. And you see, there's the aspect of empathy, trying to put yourself in, in, in somebody else's emotion. Now, as a veterinarian, I try to empathize my life to that of an animal. I try to put myself in the shoes of an animal and say, okay, if I was that cow, would I really appreciate being handled like that? If the answer to that is no, then we really have to step up and do better. Yes. And as I let's, uh, what are some of these, uh, uh, what are some of these solutions that you give to farmers in terms of, you know, some of the diseases that affect the dairy cattle? Now, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be a little biased on this because having pr practiced in the West, um, the veterinary training over here focused more on infectious diseases. So a veterinarian who practices in Kenya who um, focus more on infectious diseases like East Coast fever, uh, fever trypanosomiasis, anaplasmosis, and things like that, diseases that are transmitted and are infectious. Now, in the West, uh, I've never treated um, uh, East Coast fever. And I will tell you today, for 16 years of practice, I've never seen a tick on a cow in the West. Now, part of it has to do with the environment, uh, the cold temperatures and things like that. They're just not good environments for um, uh, some of these vector, vectors to, to flourish. So it will be different depending on what environment you are in. But now, irrespective of whatever environment, focus more on disease prevention. The world is moving away from treatment, curative measures, to preventative measures of treatment. That cuts across the entire health sector, be it in the human health sector or in the animal health industry. Because it is so costly to treat disease than to prevent disease. There is a common saying that prevention is better than cure. 
and that is where the world is headed today. Secondly, there is a very close interaction between um, 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 the, the health industry, be it animal health and human health. They call it One Health System. The world is now focusing more on the One Health approach to disease management. I'll give you a good example. We are talking of COVID right now, coronavirus. These are viruses that are zoonotic. They can be transmitted across from animals to human beings and vice versa. And you cannot just have that one line approach uh, or as a solution. You have to have both worlds uh, together. So that would be my, my, my main approach to it. Having a more rounded one health approach uh, to, to finding some of these solutions. Yeah. In USA, we know that we, you have very extreme weather patterns. It's either too hot or it's either too cold. How are you able to manage? How are the cows able to adapt to such, to those both extremes? Uh, that, that, that's a great question because I live in New York where, um, I, I, it's, thank God I'm home now. I, I left home when it was freezing. Now, uh, in winter, which is uh, one of the coldest seasons, uh, most Animal housings have uh, the bands, the housings have curtains that are um, uh, automated. So they open up and close depending on the ambient temperature. Now, in most of the farms that are worked in, and these are 10,000 cow farms, uh, they also have automatic heating systems uh, to warm up the cows. Some of them even have um, in floor heating systems. So cows are walking not on frozen floors, but the floors are constantly heated up. So those are some of the um, uh, ways of, of just taking care of, of, of the animals in those adverse conditions. Now in summer, when the temperatures are a little bit high, then you have things like sprinklers that are also automated. Now at different temperatures, you'll find sprinkler, sprinklers um, uh, uh, shedding off water and, and that will help a lot in cooling down the temperatures, uh, the body temperatures of the cows. You also have fans and those curtains that I talked about that are temperature regulated as well, they open up and close depending on the ambient temperature. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a very huge investment. Uh, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge. Now, now, like I told you, um, a place like in the US, they put a lot of emphasis on, on the dairy industry. There's a lot of money that is poured by the government and the private sector into the dairy industry. So they are able to access some of these credit facilities, very, very low taxation on the dairy industry as, uh, in general. And those are some of the incentives that just carry people towards uh, wanting to invest in the dairy sector. Wow. So are they given credit facilities uh, like, and then now they pay back after? Oh, yes. How is the now program there is, like? There is low interest credit facilities, very, very low interest credit facilities. And like I said, the government also gives a tax reprieve on farmers. Um, there, there's a level of taxation that the farmers don't have to uh, uh, pay in the United States if you are in the agricultural industry. And that is just an incentive uh, to enable the farmers um, uh, uh, meet their financial bottom lines. Yeah. Okay, we're going to be talking about insurance also. Okay. Okay, so, but at this point, you're going to be taking a short commercial break. Thank you so much for staying with us. We are with Henry, the other new? Kamagi. Henry Kamagi, who is a, a surgeon, veter a veterinary surgeon, and also a specialist in public health. We're going to be back in a short while.